uh, Grace Rashid, uh, HSE consultant, يعني health, safety, and environment consultant in the Lebanese Petroleum Administration. She will explain to us about environmental management in oil and gas exploration and production. Grace, تفضلي. Thank you, Gina and Jasmine. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, but it's, uh, your volume is a bit low. If you can raise it, please. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I will start by sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay. Okay, so I will be talking about environmental management in the oil, upstream oil and gas sector. Uh, I will start with an overview of the upstream oil and gas industry, and then we'll focus more on what we are doing in Lebanon. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me whenever you have a question, and probably there will be, there will be some terms that not everyone is familiar with, so please uh, feel free. Okay. So when we say upstream, we mean exploration and production life cycle, which basically consists of five phases, the reconnaissance, the exploration, development, production, and decommissioning. You might feel there is some overlap between this presentation and Karen's presentation. Uh, if you feel that you don't want me to go through it, please let me know. And this, uh, this is addressed to the audience as well as to uh, the host. Okay, so we start with the reconnaissance, which is the first uh, um, phase. And reconnaissance, what we're trying to do is trying to understand the geology. So we want to understand where in the seabed do we uh, have a reservoir. And to do that, we do seismic activity. The, uh, to do seismic activity, we use vessels. These vessels will be equipped with equipment that send waves down to the seabed and then collect back these waves. And then the data collected will be analyzed to be able to draw geological maps which will define, uh, later define for us where we think we might have a um, geological trap for oil and gas to be able to drill a well. Uh, this activity is associated with environmental impacts. As Karen mentioned, we do have atmospheric emissions from the seismic activity. We do have uh, some uh, discharges to the sea. We also have that the vessel could go into an accident. However, what I want to stress uh, here is that the main impact of seismic activity is basically its impact on mammals because it uses, it, it produces, it generates noise, and it also uses waves. And this actually deters mammals. The other main impact of vessels, of seismic activity, is that when the vessel is moving, it's not only the vessel, it is the vessel and behind it, there is an area of hydrophones. And so basically the footprint on the sea surface is much larger than only a vessel, which will disrupt maritime transportation, including the fishermen's movement. The second phase would be exploration. At this stage, we, have, we already have a geological map. We do know where we uh, might expect oil and gas. So what we do is we get a rig or a module, which is a mobile offshore drilling unit, and then we uh, position this rig above the well location, and we start to drill. Uh, drilling means uh, using a drill bit to actually try to cut the rocks to, to make a hole to be able to reach the reservoir where we think there is a reservoir. To do that, uh, to do that, we actually need to have, um, of, of course, this activity is also associated with impacts. I'm not going to go through them again because Karen touched upon them, but to highlight, uh, we have atmospheric emissions, which are basically from the rig itself because it has combustion and it has the generators on board, and also from helicopters that are used to transport personnel from onshore into the rig, as well as from support vessels which are moving continuously back and forth between the offshore and the onshore. Uh, an important. Uh, Grace, uh, sorry for interrupting. Yes. Uh, uh, there's a request from the students if you can please go a little bit slower so that they will uh, capture the information. Sure, sure. Excuse me uh, for that. Uh, Jasmine, I can't see uh, uh, hands the or chat? comments. Yes, so if you can uh, stop me when there's any question. Okay? Yes, okay, of course, of Thank course. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, uh, let me recap. So the exploration activity is associated with environmental impacts. It could be atmospheric emissions from the rig itself from the helicopter movement between the uh, offshore and the onshore, because usually personnel 
are uh, transported by helicopters. And also, it could be due to the support vessels, which are vessels used to transport consumables, uh, equipment, back and forth from the supply base, which is onshore, usually in a port, and the rig location. An important aspect of uh, environmental aspect of the drilling is the dr drilling cuttings. Uh, drilling cuttings, so basically this, when you want to drill, you need to use a drill bit, as I mentioned, and you uh, will use this drill bit to go down into the rock to try to break the rock to have a hole. To do that, you need a fluid. It's called uh, mud or drilling fluid. This drilling fluid, it could be water-based, so you use salt water, which is a bit treated, uh, to, be, to be able to, do, to, uh, to drill. When you do that, you have the cuttings, which are the rock bits that have been cut from the rock bed, and they will be mixed with salt water. In that case, the mixture would be a salt and rock, which is uh, relatively safe to discharge into the environment. However, as you go deeper into the uh, geology, and as you encounter more complicated geology, you cannot use salt water anymore because you need to have to ensure the safety of the process. So you move to using uh, oil-based mud or synthetic mud. In that case, uh, using oil-based mud, when you have the cuttings, the cuttings will be mixed with this oil-based mud, and then the mixture would be hazardous. And in that case, you cannot discharge it directly to the environment. You need to collect it back to the rig and then uh, take it for treatment. It is important to note that there are different drilling rig types, and there will be different uh, uh, rigs. Will be, different rigs will be selected for operation into uh, different conditions. It could be uh, specific rigs for shallow water, other rigs for deep water, also for locations. If you're drilling in the Mediterranean, it's different than drilling in uh, in the Arctic. Uh, I would like to know if any of the audience knows which drilling rig type was used to drill Block Four in Lebanon. Anyone? Um, drill ship. Exactly. So the drill ship, which we see here to the extreme left, it was the kind of uh, drilling rig that we used in Lebanon. And that we used that because we had uh, very deep water. The drilling, uh, the, the water depth was 1,500 meters below sea level. So in that case, the only uh, option to use is drill ship. After exploration, and if we find discovery, so when we do an exploration, we, we're trying to hit the target, which we ident identified as a potential location for oil and gas. When we drill, we will be able to say whether we have uh, found a discovery or not, whether the well is dry well or, it, or we actually have some oil and gas reservoir. If we do have a discovery, then we move into development. And for the development, we can have either a simple development, like the figures on the left, where we have the platform and then we have subsea installations, there could be many or few depending on the different, uh, depending on the extent of the reservoir. Or it could be a very huge and integrated kind of development where we have the offshore installations, but we also have onshore gas processing, we have liquefied natural gas uh, uh, industries, and we have uh, transportation pipelines. We could also have refining and petrochemical. However, we don't need to have everything. We can only, we can only have what's on the left side, which is the platform, the installations, and then we collect the oil and gas and transport it to, uh, to the market. Then we move into production. Production is when we actually uh, take the oil and gas that we find in the reservoir, take it up into the rig, and then take it for uh, processing and for uh, use. And this, uh, of course, this um, phase is also associated with multiple environmental impacts from uh, emissions to discharges, to also uh, accidents. But at the same time, uh, in addition to the routine uh, uh, environmental impact that we can think of, for example, emissions and discharges, we also have what we call a major accident. And this major accident, most of the times, is actually transferred into a major accident to the environment, what we call mah and mate. And in that case, uh, we are talking about fire or explosion. We are talking about an oil spill a vessel incident, a helicopter crash, it can crash on the way, on the route between the rig and the uh, onshore, it can crash, and can crash on the rig itself. Uh, we can have a blowout uh, and we can have a security incident. 
for example, I'm sure that you have all, uh, you are all familiar with the Macondo, the Deepwater Horizon, which happened in the Gulf of Mexico. the largest accidental marine oil spill in the history of the industry and in the world. Uh, the idea is it's important to understand that why if we have an, an emission, you can detect it and then you can go and correct an, an equipment or put a filter. When we have a, uh, a blowout, it's very difficult to actually be able to cap the well, to stop the flow. And in the Macondo, uh, they could not cap the well until after 87 days. So for 87 days, the well at the seabed was flowing. And eventually the total discharge was 4.9 million barrels, barrels of oil that was seeped, seeped into the environment. But at the same time, uh, a major accident does not need to be explosion or oil spill. It could be just that the rig lost balance, that the leg of the rig was broken, that the rig and the vessel, they came into, into an accident and then uh, the balance was, was, was um, tossed off the rig. And that is also a major accident because everything that is on the rig in terms of containers, chemicals, hazardous uh, waste collected, hazardous chemicals to be used will be spilled into the uh, water. So now we're moving into the uh, Lebanese uh, context. Uh, do you have any question on the above before we move? Please feel free to ask. في سؤال إجا على رأس إذا في كور كور الريف تحتهم do they do they still drill? Very good question. Usually coral reefs coral reefs are more at the coastal area. يعني بنكون بعدنا بالليتورال ما بنكون صرنا صرنا بالديب ووتر. If there can't be coral reefs, definitely you can't drill. However, the government needs to know. I mean the operator. Later, might might wish to to uh, to drill in anywhere because they are looking for the commercial part of the oil and gas. It's the government and the government entities' uh, role to actually make sure that they have they know their sensitive areas. They define their sensitive sensitive areas. Coral reef is a sensitive area and it is an endangered habitat. And in that case, they should prevent and uh, uh, do not allow drilling uh, close to these areas. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Anyone else? Okay, so, sorry? Sorry for interrupting, but I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, what is the percentage for an, uh, for an accident to happen? Stefan, I'll listen to please. We can't hear you. Can you hear me right now? No. It's very low. I will try to. I think I heard the question. It's about the percentage of uh, probability of accident. Uh, he said he's typing it. Okay. Um, he asked about what's the percentage for accidents to happen. Okay, so basically, uh, I mean, every activity, you, you cannot make an accident unless you do an activity. So the risk of an accident can always happen. However, it depends on what kind of accident, the, the severity of the accident. So if you go into this, for example, uh, you would expect to have a high risk of minor and moderate kind of accidents. It could happen every day. For example, when uh, if you have a like a, um, a winch that's working and then the winch would lose uh, the the thing that's the load that is carrying it, this could happen and it's very frequent. You could have uh, someone that would uh, um, uh, accidentally um, bump it into bump his head or cut his finger. These are minor and moderate accidents that can happen. However, the probability of a major accident is very, very low, very, very low globally. And, uh, but however, we need to keep in mind that probably even if it happens like one in five years, the impact of such a major accident is beyond imagination. So it's, uh, it's actually like uh, um, if a company does not have any accident for 10 years and then it have a major accident, it would forget totally their good reputation beforehand. So it's a matter of the severity rather than the probability of the accident. I'm not sure if you, I answered your question. Okay, Stefan, be like Michelle Hall. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, I'm, I will I move forward. Yes, please. Uh, after the incident, how how can we collect uh, the spilled oil and stuff? 
Okay, good question. I'm gonna be talking about this later on. If you answer, if your question is not answered, then please bring it back uh, later on. Okay. 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 So I'm gonna proceed, and then we'll uh, take questions as we move. Uh, uh, in terms of the what we're doing in Lebanon to to be prepared for this. So we we start first with protecting our values, and this goes for the operator as well as for the government. And we have what we call a per. Per we probably want to remember this acronym. Per means that we value the people, we value the, the environment, we value the assets, and we value the reputation. And when we think about anything, we need to keep these four values in mind to make sure that we are doing our work properly. However, in Lebanon, we do have many challenges that face us. For example, we have the geological, the geological risk. Uh, what do we mean by geological risk? We do have in Lebanon a salt layer that actually is, uh, extends uh, over almost all the offshore. Uh, the salt layer is very difficult to drill through, and also the salt layer uh, kind of blinds the seismic activity. So when you when you do seismic, if you have a salt layer, the data that you are that you collect back might not be very very accurate because the salt absorbs the wave and then it distracts the uh, bouncing back waves. So uh, you think that you might have a good geological understanding, but when you drill, it might be a, a bit of different geological map. Uh, we do have deep water environment, so it is 1,500 meters, uh, and it ranges between 800 and uh, 2,200. So it's a bit of a deep environment. And when you say deep environment, uh, it actually defines who can actually uh, operate in Lebanon. So not everyone can, uh, not everyone, not, uh, not all, not all, all companies could actually have the competence and the capacities to drill in deep water. We do have uh, sensitive areas. We know that we have MPAs, marine protected areas. We know that we have uh, canyons along the coast of Lebanon and a bit uh, towards to, uh, you know, deeper into the water. And these canyons are known to be good uh, biodiversity hotspots. So we need to make sure that we are not stepping on these. Uh, we do, the, the industry itself is associated, as you have seen before, with accidents and pollution risks. So we need to be prepared for that. However, we do have uh, a lack of HSE culture in Lebanon, and this is a problem because, I mean, you can't build a culture overnight. Uh, we know that we have a crisis management approach in the government. We don't, we don't do planning properly. And uh, as you understand, we do have industries everywhere. The industries might not be like in um, following very good international best practices. So we don't have this culture of HSE uh, in Lebanon. And you also have the issue of transboundary risks. I would like to know if someone uh, can define or um, discuss transboundary among the audience. Do you know what transboundary risks mean? Any idea? Okay, so yeah, no. when we have common land between our Okay, so transboundary, the term transboundary means across boundaries, which, which you are right in this sense. Transboundary is a risk that either generates and then moves to Lebanon. So if we have an oil spill, for example, we do have an oil let's say we have an oil spill in Lebanon, God forbid, and then this oil spill will not know that, okay, this is the border of Lebanon, don't go beyond it. It might go to Cyprus, it might go to Syria. And if there's uh, an oil spill probably in, this, uh, like in the southern border, it might also go up to Lebanon. I know that in the Levant Basin, we do have activities in Cyprus, we do have activities in Egypt, and we do have activities in Israel. So uh, there is a transboundary risk that we need to also be prepared for that. So at NPA, the Lebanese Petroleum Administration, the objectives that we have put for ourselves to be able to run the oil and gas uh, sector properly is to prevent the occurrence of a major accident, to ensure that safe and prudent operations uh, at all times, uh, and to ensure also safe and proper working environment. And Karen has spent a lot of time on, on, on defining what, what does working environment mean and how uh, we can uh, take the mitigation measures to mitigate that. And we also uh, have the objective to, to prevent pollution and to ensure prudent environmental conditions, as well as to ensure that we and the operator follow the highest HSE standards in the oil and gas sector. When you want to implement this, you would be uh, faced with a problem. You want to make an optimal balance of follow-up. So how do you, do, how do you actually regulate and, and interact with the operator? Do you use a reactive approach or do you use a proactive approach? 
The difference between the reactive and proactive is that in the reactive approach, which we are more uh, um, familiar with in Lebanon, is that we wait until a failure happen, an incident happen, an accident happen, and then we go and look into the, investigate and look into the damages and you know like uh, try to uh, do a crisis management. And the Port Beirut explosion is a major uh, example of that. But we have the other approach, with a, with, which is a proactive approach. Uh, in this approach, you actually follow up closely with the industry and you try to prevent the accident and the incident from happening the first uh, time. So you follow up a risk approach. You understand safety and you try to build a safety culture and you always uh, look for continuous imp improvement. But at the same time, you have uh, emergency preparedness and mitigation measures in place to uh, try to, as much as possible, as early on to mitigate an, an incident when it happens. So that's why in Lebanon, we are using an HSE governance model that is based on a risk, risk-based hybrid system. So what we mean by risk-based hybrid system is that we, uh, we, we, we um, uh, base everything on risks, on risk assessment and risk management. We cannot tackle and uh, regulate every single piece of equipment, anything, every single piece of sub-component uh, or sub-activity. What we do is we uh, take a risk approach to regulation. Uh, so basically, in this uh, way, we actually put the liability on the operator. What we do is we tell the operator what we want, what target we want, what uh, uh, standards that he has to meet, but we don't tell them how to do that. They are supposed to find a way which is acceptable to the government to be able to move from point A to point C. Okay? Why we do, why we do this? For example, if we look into this uh, cowboy, um, basically, this cowboy has his, uh, his horse, his means of transportation, is equipped in a good manner, he has his rope, and he's going on a mission. If you want to apply safety on this uh, cowboy, then we need to look into all aspects that will actually affect, um, uh, cause an, an incident, and try to, as much as possible, protect him in every single way, him and the horse. If we do that prescriptively, then we will end up with something like this this. In this case, yes, the horse is very, very safe. The, the cowboy is very, very safe. But the question is, can they still do their job? So the idea is, at applying the full safety measures, we will actually make the uh, activity less efficient and less effective. And this is what we don't want. What we want is actually to uh, look into the hazards, look into the risks, and try to, to avoid and manage these risks, not to over-regulate, not to prescribe regulations, but to make sure that the operator and the regulator understand every possible risk or hazard throughout the process, understand what compilation of hazards can actually lead to an accident, and try to put barriers that prevent at every sub-component, sub-activity, this hazard from actually solidifying. So basically, we rely on a barrier system. And these barriers could be technical, it could be operational, and they could be organizational. So to do that, you need to properly understand the industry. You need to properly understand all the steps taken at every activity and try to uh, define at every activity the potential risks and hazards. Try to understand who could be responsible, who could do something wrong, what, what, uh, what things could go wrong, and then try to mitigate these things early on. And in that sense, Without over-regulating, you would have eventually have a, a confident system uh, for uh, prevention of accidents. This is called the Swiss model, and it tells you that, uh, you know, the Swiss has holes, the Swiss cheese, it has holes in it. And then the, the analogy is that if all these holes are uh, aligned together, you're moving quickly from a hazard to an accident. Your job is to try to close these holes as much as possible to avoid an incident or a near miss from transforming into a major accident and ruining everything that you have in place. And to do that, we apply this risk based to safety and to environment. Uh, and we do that by uh, through the regulations that Karen already mentioned. We have at every single phase uh, a particular instruments and tools to ensure that we use a risk based. For example, we rely, we rely a lot on the SEA for petroleum activities, and we also have uh, uh, assessments of environmental impact at every stage, at the reconnaissance, uh, exploration, the production, and the decommissioning. It's important to understand that uh, the concept of safety zones, uh, a safety zone is a zone that is uh, established around a 
reg location or well location to uh, try to avoid any interaction between the rig itself and the maritime activity around it and future fishermen around it as well. In that sense, we're trying to limit the potential, for example, of accidents if fishermen are fishing in an area where oil and gas is happening and then they probably go very, very close to the rig to threaten uh, or uh, increase the, the risk of an accident, for example. And the government throughout this process will be doing monitoring, auditing, and inspection. We talk a bit about the, uh, let me go back. I want to talk about it, about the difference between strategic environmental assessment and environmental impact assessment. However, I would like to know if someone from the audience uh, know the difference. Do you know what uh, SEA and DRA, uh, why they are different? Anyone would like to take a shot? Type it in the chat box if you don't want to say it out loud. <clears throat> Maybe we can go over them quickly, uh, briefly, what is SEA and the IA. Okay, sure. Sure. So basically, as I mentioned, we have an SCA at the pre-licensing pre and planning phase, but we have EIAs throughout the process. And this is very crucial because the SCA and the EIA are a bit different. The SCA is more of a, a strategic kind of document. It is undertaken by the government, and it actually looks into the impacts of a policy plan or program. It is proactive in a, in a sense that it tries to uh, a priori identify impacts and try to prevent and avoid the impacts of some happening. And it actually uh, can give early warning of cumulative impact, impact that could uh, be not related to only one well, but related to multiple wells, multiple phases. On the other hand, an environmental impact assessment is actually focusing on the project itself, an EIA for a well, an EIA for a block, and not, uh, not an EIA for a sector or, a for, or for a plan. The EIA is basically done by the project proponent, which is the operator. It is reactive in terms of that you have the plan, you have the design, and you try to mitigate the plan and design to make to be able to comply with the regulations. And it is limited uh, in terms of the impact of the project itself. It does not take into a lot into the cumulative impacts, and probably uh, potentially it's focusing only on the well location and the project location. Other instruments that we have uh, undertaken and we still uh, implement in Lebanon is the National Oyster Contingency Plan. So, why do we need a, an uh, oyster plan? Um, I'm sure that you all remember the 2006 oil spill that uh, hit Lebanon after uh, the Israeli bombardment of the GE power plant. And at that the time, uh, you can see that uh, the uh, oil spill actually uh, extended throughout the Coast of Lebanon, it affected all the shores of Lebanon and it actually reached uh, Syria as well. It was a major catastrophe that we uh, took around three to five years to actually clean all sites. And uh, we're still, we, have, we, st we still do have some areas that we, that where recovery is, uh, could be challenging. So uh, this happened while we did not have oil and gas. And as you have seen before today, that uh, the oil and gas industry could be associated and has a potential um, for an oil spill. So at that time, we did not have an oil spill, national oil spill contingency plan, uh, and we could not, uh, uh, we did not have the organization in place. Before moving into the oil and gas, we wanted to make sure that we do have a national oil spill contingency plan to be able to mitigate and manage oil spills in the case they happen. And what we did at LPA is that we did not uh, only limit this national oil spill contingency plan to offshore oil and gas, we looked into any potential source of oil spill. So it could be from an industry, it could be from the port, and it could be from the oil and gas activities. The national oil spill contingency plan, it is a strategic in nature, and it is the, uh, done and implemented by the government, not the operator, because it's national. It defines how the government manage oil spills, and it only looks into the tier three type of oil spill. And now we'll know what, what tier three is. So we, what we have in place today is a national oil spill contingency plan. 
so basically what happens is that you can detect a spill this spill detection could be uh, could be um, detected by someone coming from the airplane and then seeing the spill in the sea it could be from a fisherman working nearby and it could be from anyone on the shore so the first thing that is done is that you detect an oil spill and then you notify authorities of the oil spill notification could be to anyone it could be to the army to the um, security forces it could be to military environment or it could be to the lpa once the spill is notification notification is undertaken then there will be a tier assessment this is the tier assessment so if the tier it would be tier one if the, if the spill is small and it's local in nature it would be tier two if it's medium and regional in nature regional which, which is not, not yet national and it could be a large spill with a national um, extent, and that would be tier three. So when we're talking about a national oil spill, we are only targeting tier three kind of spill because tier one and tier two should be covered by the operator, industry, and a site oil spills. Once the tier assessment is undertaken, then you move into the response establishment to be able to uh, contain and uh, and um, uh, clean the, the spill. So in Lebanon, what we did is uh, during this national oil spill plan, what we did is we started with scenarios. So you do have, uh, you want to, you want to um, manage your oil spill, you need to first understand the source of this oil spill. It could be from a blowout. This blowout could be oil or could be condensate. The difference between oil and condensate is that oil is very thick and it sticks in the environment. It remains there at the surface of the water. Whatever condensate is much lighter, and there's a much, much uh, higher probability that condensate evaporates and it can evaporate completely. Uh, you can also look into a scenario where you have a vessel incident, uh, accident. So you have a tanker, and then they, 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 it has an accident, and the tanker is uh, spilled. Uh, you can also have a scenario where you can change the location of the oil spill. You can make it uh, subsurface, you can make it surface, you can make it in block four, you can make it in block nine, you can make it outside Lebanon. So you have to understand all of these scenarios to be able to uh, properly manage and properly properly be prepared to manage an oil spill. In parallel, uh, we need to go and understand the, uh, uh, the littoral, the shoreline topology of Lebanon. So you need to understand where you have coastline that's grave, uh, that's uh, probably made of gravel, that's, that is made of rock, and that is sandy, because that will affect uh, the severity of the impact on the shoreline, and it will also affect the methods used to clean the shoreline later on. So we try to run all the scenarios in a model. Uh, you, you have many models there on, uh, in the world that you can use, but you have to make sure that the model that you use is relevant to your condition. So uh, to do the modeling, you have to input the hydrodynamics, the currents, the water temperature, uh, the wind at the, at the time, and you run the, your model. The model will actually uh, simulate for you how, will, how this oil spill will change and move with time. Uh, you can run the oil spill once. So for example, you can say that let's spill one uh, barrel only for one hour and then stop everything. And you can do something like Mohondo, where you can start a spill and then let it spill for 87 days, and you can see how the impact of the spill would change. After that, you can go and then check whether this oil spill will actually beach. It will actually uh, end up at the shoreline, and you go and, and, and define the impact of this shoreline. So you have a map which tells you which shorelines will be impacted, when they will be first impacted, and that will help you define your response strategies. What could the response strategies be? So you could uh, actually just monitor and evaluate. If it's condensate, what we do is we monitor and evaluate. We use the helicopters. We, we um, uh, um, fly around over the area and you see how, this, how the area is, uh, how the condensate is moving, how it is, um, the sheen is uh, thinning and then it is evaporating. Other things we can do is we, use, we can use dispersants. Dispersants are uh, uh, compounds that we drop on the oil and gas, and they help them to dis dissolve, to, dis to uh, disintegrate, and then it will be easier for them to, to be diluted. Uh, dispersants, of course, are chemicals, and their use should be uh, approved by the Ministry of Environment. You could only contain and recover. So you can use, uh, if, if you can see in the second photo on the left, you can use ships that have booms. And booms are actually like, of, like pillows that absorb oil and gas. You can have a boom that, which is connected to, the, to two vessels, and the vessels 
um, like sail around an oil spill and try to contain it as if like you, you are containing a skim from the top of a, of, of a barrel. What you can uh, do as well is that if you know that an oil spill is heading towards affecting a shoreline, you go and protect the shoreline. And to protect the shoreline, you have to around again surrounded by booms. Uh, we can do in situ burning. Some people in the world do in situ burning where they actually uh, lit the oil to, to allow the oil to um, fire. And then they, of course, they save, they, I mean, solve the problem of oil spill, but they change the uh, pollution from a water discharge into an air pollution. And we do not at all uh, in Lebanon uh, recommend, recommend that. And eventually, if, if unfortunately the oil uh, ended up reaching on the shoreline, then you have to do shoreline cleanup. And that is a very, very um, loaded and time and effort consuming uh, activity. And uh, it actually affects, it's different, different uh, methodology would be used to clean up a sandy beach or a rocky beach or a cultural area, for example. And we actually had this problem in the 2006 oil spill back then. I'm not going to go through this. The other thing that we can use uh, in terms of environmental management, as we said before, is the SCA. In Lebanon, we have done an SCA. We have done two SCAs, actually. But why do we need the SCA? We need the SCA as a, as a government, as a national government, to plan in a sustainable way. We need to, a priori, before we open our licensing, uh, our offshore for licenses, before we define what activities are allowed, what activities are not allowed, we need to understand. So. Uh, the SCA allows us to plan in a sustainable way. Uh, you know that uh, although you might have a very well uh, comprehensive regulations, there could be uh, inc instances where you have uh, some gaps, and the SCA would be uh, trying to identify any potential gaps in the environmental regulation and trying to fill them up by strategies. Uh, the SCA is a very good opportunity to integrate other stakeholders in the sector management, to hear to the fishermen, to hear to the NGOs, to other national authorities, what they think, what they have concerns, and try to accommodate that. And it also allows to uh, weigh the pros and cons of every uh, of the program, uh, which blocks to open, uh, what strategies to use, what kind of methodology to accept. So what we did with the uh, SEA in Lebanon, we uh, the SEA framework covered the full phases from reconnaissance to decommissioning. We also, uh, because it's very difficult to, to understand from today how the sector will evolve with time. So we also worked into scenarios. We have a scenario where we, uh, we do nothing. We just stop everything. We don't do oil and gas. And then we have another, another scenario where we do exploration, but we don't find a discovery. For example, this happened in block four. We did exploration, but we did not find a discovery. Uh, that would be, so in that case, your impacts will only be limited to the exploration. And we also have another scenario where we uh, do exploration, we find uh, discovery, however, the discovery is very, very small. And in that case, you will only need low development. And then you have the uh, full uh, uh, scenario where you have high development. You, you explore, you find oil and gas, and you go into full development. And of course, you can tell that the impacts would change and the severity of the impact and the multitude of impacts will increase as we go from scenario one to scenario four. What we did is we uh, looked into the uh, impacts, all impacts possible uh, for, all the, for all the phases. And then we tried to um, uh, assess these impacts uh, to identify whether, how, likely, how likely are they to happen and the severity of each. And uh, eventually we tried to put mitigation measures. Uh, these mitigation measures could be specific actions, or they could be strategies. And then the SCA uh, would define uh, which actions are to be taken by the government and which actions are need to be taken by the operator. In this way, the operator will then take these actions and they need to incorporate them in the EIAs when they do the specific EIA for a particular activity or a particular block. Uh, so, so in the SCA that we did, we looked into the environmental aspects. Uh, we covered fisheries, chemicals, hazardous waste, uh, the noise and acoustic environment, also archaeology, of course, air emissions and greenhouse gases. But we also covered the social and economic aspects because the SCA is a strategic document which uh, tries to keep the balance between environment, economy, and social development. So when you want to think and you want to plan, you want to make decision making, you have to think of, uh, along these three lines, environment, social social aspects and economic aspects. 
because as you know that the oil and gas of course it will bring employment it will bring jobs however it can also affect negatively if we have for example an accident it can uh, affect if you have an oil spill uh, so all of these need to be taken into account and try to be uh, uh, understood and planned together and uh, the SCA will eventually end up with different recommendations that will try to, uh, after identifying the impacts, try to make sure that we can live with these impacts through defining strategies to be uh, adopted. For example, uh, one recommendation of the SCA is to do a baseline. So the baselines should be done prior to any activity. And this means that the operator in every um, block will need to do some kind of baseline uh, to understand whether they have coral reefs, for example, in the block, whether they have sensitive environments, whether they don't have anything in the block, to be able to understand what, what are the impacts and how the impacts or the activity will interact with the environment. Also, the SEA recommends that we have an activity level monitoring, which is that we monitor activities as, we, uh, as the activity is being undertaken. And in some cases, it requests that we do a post-activity monitoring the post-activity monitoring uh, helps us to compare the baseline before and after the activity. And in that sense, we can understand uh, and quantify the impact if any of the activity that's taking place. Another recommendation of the SCA were, uh, of course, as I mentioned, to EIA mainstream. So the SCA will define the framework for the EIAs and then every EIA will need to use SCA as a, as a reference to be able to, as much as possible, look to the mitigation and set strategies that the SCA has put to be able to adopt. The SCA uh, also defined uh, what should we do for the waste and chemical management. The SCA uh, called upon the use of water-based drilling fluids as much as possible. So operators need to use water-based drilling fluids and if they're not uh, using water based, they need to uh, argue and justify why. And also, the SCA requested that EIAs in particular areas do specific kind of studies. They, uh, to do noise modeling, for example, to do discharge modeling, and to do oil spill modeling. So, this was a brief on what we uh, have in place to be able to regulate. Of course, we did not go into everything, but we, I tried to highlight things that could be interesting to you. Uh, I'm going to go now into the compliance of the operators. However, if you have any question or any uh, clarification, uh, I'm happy to take it. Okay. So Seems, probably, uh, no questions. Okay, so probably leave it uh, till later. Okay. So we're going to go through the operator's uh, compliance status. So uh, as you probably know, uh, the first well was drilled in block four, which you can see in the upper uh, right uh, picture. It is about 19, 19 kilometers from Beirut. And uh, the big picture shows, uh, shows the, the rig position, which is within the territorial waters of Lebanon. And it has this uh, circle around it. Does anyone know what this circle around the rig position mean? Okay, so I will, I will tell you. We have talked before about the safety zone, and you said that the safety zone is actually uh, established around the rig position to, to kind of protect the rig from uh, maritime uh, traffic and from fisheries. And this is the safety, safety zone. So we have the rig, which is in um, uh, the black dot, and then you have a circle around it, which is uh, dotted. This is a safety zone. It's usually 500 meters around the rig location. And it, uh, once the rig is in location, this safety zone and the rig location has to be put in all hydrographic maps in the world. Because any uh, tanker, any commercial ship which is coming through the Lebanese waters needs to understand that there is a rig in this position and that you ha there, ha there is a safety zone around it that you cannot come close to or across. Okay? Uh, moving forward, so uh, basically the operator in Block 4, which is the consortium of Petrol, Eni, and Novatec, they followed the recommendations of the regulations and the SEA, and they started with an environmental and social baseline. Uh, this was the first ever offshore environmental survey in Lebanon. Uh, they did it together for Block 4 and Block 9 because of, uh, uh, to, cap to capitalize on time and uh, money. 
For Block 4, they did, they did it in March uh, 2018, and uh, the survey covered the depth from 320 meters to 1780 uh, meters. They took four water samples. Uh, you can see them uh, in the figure on the right. Uh, this figure shows the bathymetry of uh, Block 4, and it shows the green dots show the uh, water sample location and sediment sample locations, while the red uh, lines show the transects. So they also took 10 VG transects. On the ship that, on the vessel that actually did this uh, baseline, there was also a marine archaeologist to be able to uh, look for uh, any cultural debris or cultural um, uh, uh, item that they might find. And we also had observators, uh, observers uh, using PAM, which uh, basically is used to identify any mammals in the area or any mammals, not, not, not necessarily in Block 4, around Block 4, because they use acoustics to uh, identify mammals. And the other pictures uh, that you see on this slide are from uh, our offshore waters. You can see we have some diversity of, uh, of life. Of course, these are from different depths, so it's, they're not only from the 1500 meter. Uh, and also you can see um, uh, on the bottom right, uh, the vessel. This, uh, this is a part of the vessel where you can see there's a winch and a, a, like a cube. This cube is actually used to collect the samples. So you, you lower this cu uh, cube into the seabed from the uh, dock of the vessel, and then you can collect samples. And this cube is also associated with a camera, so you can also uh, monitor how the process is happening, what it's happening in real time. And then after they did the social and environmental baseline, they moved forward to uh, prepare for other activities. The expression activities, they, they included, of course, one well in block four. And to do the well, they actually uh, had this uh, drill ship, as you uh, mentioned before, uh, which was called the Tungsten Explorer. This drill ship was used uh, to drill the well in Block 4, and to support it, we had uh, three different um, uh, PSVs, which are the supply vessels. And then at any time within the safety zone, which is here and highlighted in the um, uh, red uh, box, uh, around this, around the rig, you would have the rig itself, and then you would have one ship which will be there at all times, and that would be called a safety ship, a, a safety ship, yes, yeah, safety vessel, and its job is to make sure that no boat, uh, or fisherman boat, or commercial ship uh, approaches the ship, and it's called, I mean, it does some patrolling, and uh, it's there to ensure the security of the area. At the same time, you have another uh, vessel that will be moving back and forth between the rig location and the port of Beirut, where we have the supply vessel. We also have a, a helicopter, which is basically used to transport uh, personnel from the Rafi uh, Haile International Airport to the rig location. And uh, as you know, the supply base was in the port of Beirut, as you can see in the map uh, mentioned. In addition, the operator, they did, uh, the consortium, they did an environmental impact assessment for the block uh, four. And uh, this impact assessment was basically, uh, it included all, uh, all kinds of, um, or potential kind of modeling. So they included noise modeling, they included oil spill modeling, which is independent from what we did as a government. Uh, their oil spill modeling was specific for the well location and specific scenarios for the relative to the risk assessment that they did for the drilling activity. They also did discharge and cutting modeling because total, they, uh, for the first section of the well, they used water-based mud, which we talked about before. Uh, and that in that case, they because water-based uh, mud is relatively environmental friendly, they were allowed to discharge it to the seabed. But to be able to do that, they had to model the discharge and to um, uh, justify to the government that the discharge will not extend to a greater area of uh, impact and it will not um, uh, uh, induce high sedimentation in the well location. Um, at the same time, they put the different management plans, including waste management plan, chemical management plan, uh, oil spill contingency plan, and emergency plans. And it's important to note uh, uh, that because we don't have uh, a proper infrastructure for hazardous waste management in Lebanon, uh, we as LPA and the Ministry of Environment, we uh, asked Total to actually not, inc not uh, uh, enter any kind of hazardous waste management to the Lebanese uh, onshore. So all the waste that was uh, generated from the activity, all hazardous waste, 
was directly docked into the supply vessels, and these supply vessels transported the waste directly from the rig location to Cyprus, where they have proper infrastructure to treat hazardous waste and, um, and uh, dispose of. Uh, in addition, the environmental impact assessment that uh, the consortium did, it included two stages, a scoping stage and an EIA stage. And for, the, for both stages, they did a stakeholder engagement, a very um, interactive stakeholder engagement where they included different stakeholders and they had different sessions. In addition, it was the first time that any EIA is put online for, uh, uh, for engagement. So basically, you don't need to show up for any uh, meeting. You can read, you can download the EIA, you can read it and then comment on it and send it to us for uh, to, to include, to understand your concerns and include them within the EIA. So we mentioned that the total, they also did an OSP contingency plan. In this case, they only looked into tier one and tier two um, kind of spurs and they developed uh, extensively their organization, how they want to respond, who is responsible for what, uh, how they want to, what method they will be using to um, contain the spill and to manage the spill. And uh, also they use this based on, of course, risk assessment and specific scenarios. In addition, they did an emergency response plan. And this is not only related for oil spills, it, is, it covers all potential accidents, whether it is a, a fire, it is a blowout, it is a uh, crash between the vessel and another vessel or the vessel and the rig. And in this um, uh, emergency response plan, they again went into the risk assessment. They defined the organization uh, for the emergency. They uh, uh, established an emergency center here in Beirut in their offices, as well as they um, made sure that they have proper linkages with Total uh, Center in uh, Pau in France. And also they, we did an exercise together as LPA, as the operator, as well as the army through their uh, uh, maritime, uh, I mean, mar marine uh, Navy forces. And uh, they also did uh, trainings and drills for their personnel. And I'm uh, very happy to say that we have already undertaken drilling in a block four with uh, zero incidents and accidents. That was a major achievement for us. And we, uh, so for the time being block four, the first well is uh, done. Uh, unfortunately, it was a dry well, so we don't have a discovery in block four in the well location. This does not mean that we don't have uh, potential uh, other places in Block 4. We are still uh, currently under, undergoing a discussion with the tile how to proceed with the second, with the second expiration period, uh, with, which potentially would um, require them to undertake another well in Block 4. Uh, however, the most uh, recent or the most, uh, I mean, early on uh, uh, thing to look forward is, uh, to is the drilling in Block 9. The second well, uh, offshore well would be in block nine, and that would is proper is uh, originally planned for uh, later this year. However, due to the global problems that we're facing, whether the pandemic or the uh, overall uh, reduction in the prices of the oil and this a bit of shift into uh, away from oil and gas, this might affect the uh, timing of the uh, drilling, which could be um, mid next year. So we will be uh, taking it from there. So this is everything that I had to say. I'm happy to take any questions or clarifications if there are. Thank you, Grace. Very interesting presentation. Questions, anyone? Questions, comments. Uh, one more thing I would I would like to say is that if you wish, you can uh, visit the LPA website where we have the SEA posted, and we also have the EIA that Total uh, did uh, posted there. And uh, we will be uh, updating it with other um, uh, information and documents as uh, we go further. Yes, thank you, Grace. 